The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody, and welcome to May's ReproAction webinar. Um, today, we will be discussing fetal personhood, the anti-abortion agenda. So let's go ahead and get into it. So first, I will introduce myself and then pass it over to my lovely co-host. Uh, so my name is Jessica Ensley. I use she, her pronouns. I am the Senior Vice President of Outreach here at ReproAction, and I am based in Washington, D.C., and I will kick it over to Kieran. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, my name is Kieran Mailman. My pronouns are they and he. Uh, I am the Senior Strategic Research Director for ReproAction, and I am based in Northern Virginia. Great. So here is an overview of the agenda. I will introduce our organization, um, and then we'll go over the topic before we dive into our wonderful panel that we have today. And then we'll head on over to next steps before we get to Q&A. At any point, if you have questions for our panelists or um, something regarding the introduction as we go through it, please enter them in the chat, and we will get to them at the end portion of the webinar. And you can join us um, on the conversation by live tweeting uh, with hashtag ReproAction. All, all right, so to introduce ReproAction, um, we lead bold action to increase access to abortion and advance reproductive justice. We are known for our left flank analysis, our willingness to hold folks on all sides accountable, including allies or opposition, and our commitment to nonviolent direct action. All right, so I will kick it over to Kieran to introduce the topic today. Thank you, Jessica. So first, I just want to talk a little bit about the history of abortion restrictions. Uh, and just to note at the top, while anti-abortion activists attempt to frame fetal personhood as an objective scientific fact, there is not and never has been a consensus on this topic. Even heavily Christian cultures have historically accepted abortion up until what they referred to as quickening, uh, which was about 16 to 20 weeks of pregnancy. So there is not a historical or modern consensus on the idea of fetal personhood. There are two key factors behind abortion bans, uh, and note abortion bans are often proposed under the banner of fetal personhood, uh, and these two factors are racism and greed. So in the mid to late 1800s, most abortions were provided by midwives, about half of whom were Black. These midwives were seen as a threat to the profits of white male doctors and in response were demonized. We see this fetal personhood rhetoric escalate ahead of Roe v. Wade with anti-abortion activists attempting to use the 14th Amendment, which provides all citizens with equal protection under the law to establish fetal personhood. Roe ended up preventing states from establishing fetal personhood before the idea of viability which is a pretty vague goalpost that anti-abortion activists are constantly trying to move. So this slide I pulled from a larger, more in-depth uh, timeline made by Legal Voice. If you're interested in learning more detailed information about the fetal personhood movement in the US, highly recommend this resource from Legal Voice. So in 1884, we see the first recorded case of fetal personhood being struck down in Massachusetts. And around this time, other states that saw this kind of legislation followed suit and struck down this fetal personhood. I'm not going to, nonsense. Um, fast forward a good bit to 1973, just after Roe was decided, the Human Life Amendment to the Constitution was proposed. This defines the right to life as starting from conception. Um, it was not accepted. Then in 1986, we see Minnesota pass a law that treats the death of a fetus as homicide in some cases, which effectively grants legal personhood in, or fetal personhood in some cases without using the fetal personhood rhetoric. In 2003, the Texas Penal Code defined a fetus as a person from fertilization, which has implications for sentencing. In 2004, the Unborn Victims of Violence Act passes. This law makes embryos and fetuses legal victims. So if, for example, a pregnant person was injured and the injury caused harm to their fetus, whoever caused the injury could be charged for harming both the pregnant woman and their fetus. In 2008, 
uh, we saw the first personhood ballot amendment introduced and rejected in Colorado. Colorado proceeded to reject similar amendments in 2010 and 2014. In 2013, we saw the Alabama Supreme Court rule that the state's chemical endangerment law, which was meant to be used to prosecute those giving substances to minors, can be used to prosecute those who use substances during pregnancy. In 2018, Alabama voters passed the Unborn Life Ballot Initiative, which made the Alabama Constitution recognize the rights of fetuses, including the right to life. So this was basically a state-level version of the Human Life Amendment. A few years later, we see the Life at Conception Act introduced at the federal level, which would have given fetuses the right to life under the 14th Amendment. So seeing increasing state and federal legislation pushing this idea of fetal personhood. Then in 2002, Roe v. Wade was overturned. This means that states are now able to introduce and enact legislation that prohibits abortion before this idea of viability. Today, 39 states have fetal homicide statutes and 14 ban abortions with minimal exceptions. So we'll get more into the impacts of fetal personhood as we talk with our incredible panelists, but just a quick overview of some of these impacts. Uh, increased criminalization of pregnancy and pregnancy outcomes is a pretty clear impact of this idea of fetal personhood. When fetuses are implicitly given personhood, pregnant people, and especially pregnant people of color, are more likely to face criminalization. This idea of fetal personhood could also have an impact on contraceptive access. Anti-abortion activists regularly frame some forms of contraception as abortifacients. So the, for these forms of contraceptive and those who use them could also face harms under this idea of fetal personhood. Under fetal personhood, child endangerment laws could be used to restrict what care pregnant people are able to receive. If a treatment such as chemotherapy could potentially harm the fetus, pregnant people could have treatment withheld until they've given birth. And we've already seen the impact that fetal personhood ideology can have on IVF in the Alabama Supreme Court ruling um, that promoted this idea of fetuses uh, being persons from conception. Um, in the wake of that, Alab the Alabama uh, Congress introduced legislation condemning that Alabama Supreme Court ruling, uh, and 13 prominent anti-abortion activists have come out in support of this ruling, including Lila Rose, whose tweet praising the Alabama Supreme Court I've included here. And I will pass, well, now we can move on to our next panelist. I am super excited to get to introduce our first panelist, Kulsum Ijaz, uh, pronounced she, her. Kulsum is a senior staff attorney fighting pregnancy criminalization and pregnancy justice. Prior to joining, she was a staff attorney at the Center for Reproductive Rights, dedicating her time to litigating reproductive rights cases nationwide. She was also previously a senior staff attorney at Legal Services of New York City where she championed people's rights to safe, affordable, and fair housing. As a founding advocacy chair of the American Muslim Bar Association, she brings her passion for community and coalition building to every endeavor. Kulsum also formerly rehabbed birds, finds inspirations in the lessons they offer about collective liberation, and writes about them at her Instagram, Birds for Abolition. Kulsum, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm really grateful to be here and in such great company. So, Kulsum, when I was doing my research for this webinar, I found a really incredible resource from Pregnancy Justice on fetal personhood that draws attention to the ways existing laws can already be used to enforce this idea of fetal personhood. Can you talk about some of these laws and how they've been used to criminalize behavior during pregnancy and pregnancy outcomes? Thank you for that question. Um, yes, I'd like to first begin, though, by saying that the concept of fetal personhood is a tool used to dehumanize and criminalize pregnant and birthing people under the guise of conferring full legal and constitutional rights to fertilize eggs. This was a concept that was weaponized even under the Roe regime by rogue state actors who clutched their pearls to deny pregnant people the right to make 
healthcare decisions for themselves. And I'd like to give a quick example of the story of Angela Carter. Um, Angela Carter was 26 weeks pregnant and was dying of cancer. A DC Superior Court judge ordered an emergency C-section over the objections of her family and even her doctors who believed she would not have wanted it. The baby died two hours after the operation and she died two days later. In 1990, the DC Court of Appeals ruled in a precedent setting decision that a pregnant woman had a virtually had virtually in unlimited right to decide the course of her medical treatment for herself and her fetus. But this still happened and it happened under Roe. And things are only going to get worse under when this concept is being weaponized to deny people medical care altogether today and is weaponized to uh, and is weaponized to advance child abuse statutes to criminalize conduct that otherwise wouldn't be criminalized but for a pregnant person's pregnancy. Thank you for mentioning our uh, fetal personhood report. I also want to mention our Rise of Pregnancy Criminalization Report, another great resource for more on how fetal personhood is being weaponized across the nation to deny pregnant people their rights. Um, and I urge everyone to stay tuned for more reporting on this because, again, it's only going to get worse. And in its worst incarnation, um, fetal personhood is essentially a framework that, criminalized pregnant, that criminalizes pregnant people for merely existing while being pregnant. And I'll give you a quick example of this. Alabama leads the nation in pregnancy criminalization. And Ashley Caswell, um, a person who lives in Alabama, was prosecuted and incarcerated under the chemical endangerment of a child statute in the state because of substance use during pregnancy under this guise that drug use harms fetal health. But we know that fetal health is just pretext. If Alabama cared so much about fetal health, they wouldn't have incarcerated Ashley. They wouldn't have then denied her psychiatric medication. They wouldn't have denied her um, as a high risk pregnant person pre and postnatal care. They wouldn't have forced her to give birth in a jail shower um, while she pleaded for help and lost a considerable amount of blood and almost died. It's worth noting that her case is not an outlier. Alabama has one of the worst records for maternal and infant health outcomes, and criminalization is not happening equally to all people. It's very clearly happening to, as um, you mentioned, black, brown, and poor communities, and people who use substances, uh, because all major institutions in our country are rooted in white supremacy and patriarchy. And so instead of addressing poverty, and food insecurity and environmental injustices, all known social determinants of health that do in fact cause poor maternal and infant health outcomes, states like Alabama are funding carceral measures to further oppress minoritized and vulnerable communities. I also want to highlight fetal homicide laws, um, which are closely related to fetal personhood and are based on the same ideology. At least 38 states have fetal homicide laws, and some states have used them to prosecute people for experiencing pregnancy loss, including when someone gives birth to a stillborn. Again, these are carceral responses to problems that require compassionate care and resources. Cool, Sue, thank you so much. And thank you especially for reminding us that even under Roe, criminalization was still an issue. Like these violent forms of criminalization are not new. Um, so I wanted to ask you next. Um, so hospitals have mandatory reporting laws uh, that require providers to report certain types of uh, behaviors and needs, or excuse me, I'm a little scrambled on that. Um, but do certain mandatory reporting laws promote this idea of fetal personhood? And if so, how does this impact pregnant people who use or have used substances? Thank you for that question. Yes, I want to first 
stress by saying that nine out of 10 cases where pregnant people are criminalized based on their pregnancy involve allegations of substance use. And 80% of these charges include weaponizing child endangerment, neglect, or abuse statutes. More than half of states that have law, most more than half of our states have laws that require reporting related uh, to a pregnant person's use of alcohol or drugs during pregnancy um, and or define alcohol or drug use during pregnancy as child abuse or neglect. Um, because of these legal regimes, healthcare and family policing systems have uh, come to play a significant role in sustaining efforts to criminalize pregnancy. In fact, 32.5% of arrests were instigated by a medical professional. So there's a clear um, through line here for the hospital to uh, family policing to prison pipeline. And it's worth mentioning that care at a publicly funded hospital looks very different from a privileged person getting privately funded care. Uh, poor communities are uniquely targeted with carceral responses to community problems, despite every leading medical and public health association in the nation opposing punitive responses to pregnancy because it worsens health outcomes. Um, you know, our, our society has increasingly recognized that substance use is a public health um, issue um, you know, with the recent rise of uh, opioid use, um, but people who are pregnant are instead met with the same criminalization approaches that were developed under the so-called war on drugs to take parental rights away and to criminalize pregnant and birthing people and to deny them resources and medical care instead of promoting uh, the hospital to carceral system pipeline. Um, you know, it's it's worth stressing again and again and again that pregnant people need to be met with support, treatment if necessary, and prenatal care. That's how we can ensure the health of pregnant people, families, and communities. Um, and it's also worth highlighting that the CDC has reported that the leading cause of pregnancy-related deaths in the nation are mental health conditions, and that includes deaths by suicide and substance use disorder, which is a mental health condition. What we're seeing today is a failure of priorities. If we want to address maternal and infant health, we need to respond with strategies that aren't based on oppressing people, but instead with strategies that are evidence-based to get better outcomes for everyone. Kulsum, thank you so much. And I appreciate the way that you tied in this idea of maternal and infant health to these fetal personhood laws because the anti-abortion movement likes to frame itself as being very pro-woman and pro-child, but the laws and the rhetoric that they're pushing clearly indicate otherwise. Now, you've, you've answered this last question, at least partially in both of your other answers, but I wanted to see if you could talk a little bit more about the ways that these laws that promote fetal personhood harm marginalized communities and specifically which marginalized communities are most at risk? Absolutely. Um, I want to start by putting on my Grim Reaper hat here. Uh, while the Fifth Circuit's decision on EMTALA, EMTALA is a federal legislation that requires Medicare participating hospitals to provide stabilizing care to patients in, in their EDs. Um, while the Fifth Circuit's decision on EMTALA was only applicable to Texas and HHS didn't appeal that decision to the U.S. Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court may look to the Fifth Circuit's reasoning when reviewing the relationship between EMTALA and Idaho's total abortion ban to deny pregnant people the right to stabilizing care in emergency rooms under the guise of fetal personhood. The Fifth Circuit talked at great length about how fetuses are people in its decision. And if the US Supreme Court is inspired by its morally bankrupt and intellectually dishonest arguments, we will be looking at even more brazen policies and laws designed to harm marginalized communities. Um, Dr. Chiara Bridges, a reproductive law professor at Berkeley, does an incredible job stressing just who these anti-abortion regimes most impact. 
um, in the 1980s, the, the, the crack cocaine stare uh, was weaponized to harm black communities. Uh, states used criminal laws um, to uh, criminalize drug use during pregnancy and punish black communities for quote unquote, harming their babies. And uh, Dr. Kiara Bridges has warned that, you know, now the chickens have really come home to roost here, so to speak. And the same rhetoric is used to punish for white communities, as we've seen in pregnancy justices, most recent reporting on um, pregnancy prosecutions and um, on, on fetal personhood more broadly. Um, and, and recently, you know, Dr. Kiara Bridges um, at a seminar I listened to on Comstock actually incisively highlighted that longitudinal studies of children exposed to cocaine in utero don't differ from kids who were not exposed to cocaine. Uh, poverty, in fact, poverty is the most accurate indicator of whether a child is likely to die. So that then begs the question, right? What are we doing here? Um, substance use, right, during pregnancy is just smoke and mirrors. It is used to distract the public from the real problems. Poverty, no access to universal health care. When there is health care, that health care system is punitive behaves as an arm to the carceral state to oppress poor communities, promotes racial biases to deny coverage to BIPOC communities. And these communities are siphoned off into neighborhoods with the highest rates of pollution in their air, water, and soil. And so I really wanna close by stressing to everyone, right? To get out there and to fight the stigma, to support proactive approaches to decoupling our healthcare system from policing and to push back against fetal personhood in all the ways, including by repealing legislation, getting better judges on the bench, promoting pregnant people's personhood. We need all hands on deck. Kulsum, thank you again for being here today. I'm so grateful we all got to hear from you. And I am going to pass it back to Jessica to introduce our next panelist. Great. Thank you both so much. And just a quick note, um, closed captions are technically turned on, but it seemed to have stopped working. Um, so apologies. I'm going to leave the program working. Hopefully it'll pick back up. Um, but I would love to introduce our next panelist, uh, Jessica Piclo, she, her pronouns, is the Senior Vice President and Executive Editor of Rewire News Group, the nation's only media nonprofit dedicated exclusively to covering reproductive and sexual health rights and justice. She is also the co-host of Boom Lawyer Podcast with Imani Gandhi, which is excellent. Highly recommend people listen to it. Jessica, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for being here. And as part of what an esteemed panel, it is absolutely my pleasure. Wonderful. So my first question for you um, is through your work at Rewire, I know you're intimately familiar with the ways the anti-abortion movement intersects with other dangerous far-right movements. What are some parallels you see between the fetal personhood movement and the white supremacist movement? And are there any specific groups that you see that are furthering these ties? Absolutely. Thank you so much um, for that question. I would um, say that they are not just parallels, but they are one in the same. And I think um, Coulson in her presentation really drove some of that home. I was very grateful that uh, she talked about the Imtala arguments at the Fifth Circuit, because through the conservative legal movement, we really see the stitching together of um, the fetal personhood movements and white supremacist movements. So I would caution folks to think about to think about this less as movement specific and more uh, uh, in lines of aligned political interests because that's really what they are so um, as has already gone through the uh, the goal really of fetal personhood is to rewrite and reorder our legal understanding of the 14th amendment and using fetuses the idea of life beginning at conception 
conception as the Trojan horse for that. But it is part and parcel of the same movement that is, for example, looking to upend the idea of birthright citizenship for people who have uh, children and are of undocumented or immigrant status and have those children within U.S. borders. So to have a conversation about who is a citizen and who is a person under the law is really to interrogate the entire structure of who is a person in this country generally and what relationship do they have with the state. So that is a very big um, picture uh, answer to that question. But to drill down into are there any specific groups? Yes. Um, we have some of the very vocal arms and wings of the anti-abortion movement in the form of Operation Save uh, America, for example, that is actively pushing for fetal personhood measures and those that would also punish folks who have um, abortions and provide them beyond just the usual routes of criminalization that we see. We have the Alliance Defending Freedom, you know, uh, which is the uh, probably uh, preeminent conservative legal advocacy organization in this country here, making explicitly legal uh, fetal personhood arguments before the Supreme Court. They did so in the Imtala case, which has been briefly mentioned, and they continue to do so in other avenues um, uh, across the country in appellate circles. And I would say we have the entire conservative movement and Republican Party at this moment who has signed on to these measures in various shapes and form. We, we've uh, seen a mention already of the Human Life Amendment at the federal level. This would, you know, our current Speaker of the House, uh, Mike Johnson, is one of the co-sponsors of that. That would create the kind of regime nationally that Alabama has created for itself within its borders. Um, so the, the full weight of the conservative movement when it comes to personhood is behind this, even if not all of them say so uh, with their full chests just yet. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much for walking us through that. Um, turning a bit uh, in subject to my next question for you, um, as your specialty of as executive editor at Rewire News Group, what, what are some successful strategies for journalists and activists in order to challenge the fetal personhood narrative? One of the reasons this country finds itself where in the place that it is in with regard to abortion rights and access is because of a national media's failure to interrogate the anti-choice movement and instead has opted to act more or less as stenographers for them. And so what I am imploring journalists to do is not that. And that is to start also, and they're, they're very practical ways to do this. You can ask if you are interviewing lawmakers, for example, what the practical implications of their abortion bans are. You know, we don't need explicitly, uh, we don't need laws explicitly establishing fetal personhood, life beginning at conception under the 14th Amendment to already see those effects, as we've seen in this webinar already. Um, if you ask someone, well, what is the effect of banning abortion entirely? How does the state prove that? What you're doing is changing the narrative in um, the media, in culture, in you know the sort of kitchen table conversations from one around pregnancy termination to one around law enforcement expansion, because that's what we're talking about here, whether it's an abortion ban, fetal personhood, or the sideways attempts when Roe was still a uh, law of the land to come at this, the main through line is all a dramatic expansion of police power, of surveillance power, and of carceral systems in our community. And so that is an understanding that journalists absolutely need uh, and a framing to embrace in order to change that narrative. But first and foremost, don't just take the anti-choice movement at its word. If you ban abortion, you automatically believe in punishing people who need abortions. And you can't say both things at the same time. They can't possibly be both true. Absolutely. Yeah, that is um, something that 
we here at Reproduction have known for, for a long time and have been lucky enough to work alongside um, folks at Rewire News and, and other organizations in order to really um, break that down for folks. So yeah, very important that um, journalists and editors um, and just generally people um, in the activism space get that get that language correctly, um, that abortion bans equal criminalization of pregnant people. Um, and uh, my my last question for you right now is, um, from what you've seen in your work, what do you see as the next steps or goals of the fetal personhood movement? This is an excellent question because it is really about the you know future of democracy. And I mean that quite sincerely. What we are witnessing is a movement, as I said, to redefine who gets to count as a person in this country. And so that is not just whether or not a fetus has legal rights starting from conception, but whether or not LGBTQ people can fully be ourselves in public also with the full civic rights and privileges that attach to that as well. So the next steps or goals of the fetal personhood movement is to redefine who legally is a person from cradle to grave and to do so in ways that reinforce white power structures because demography is not on their side. And this is really one of the last grasp efforts that we are, have, are witnessing for folks attempting to retain power by force if necessary. So we need to be talking about these movements in the same breath as we need to be talking about January 6th and the upcoming election uh, in November, because it is part and parcel of the same encroaching and established in some places autocraticness direction of this country. So the fetal personhood movement wants to not just ban abortion nationwide, not just declare life begins at conception, which would outlaw most forms of hormonal contraception, IVF, assisted reproductive technologies, all sorts of immediate uh, implications in terms of pregnancy termination, but has already been described in this webinar also, it exacerbate the, the really tragic and, and you know, criminal disparities between who has access to care, who is criminalized, and who is allowed to continue on with pregnancies. I mean, the impact in all vulnerable communities in terms of care, should the fetal personhood movement have its way, it cannot be overstated. Yeah, that is, um, Thank you for that breakdown. It's um, very powerful um, and cannot thank you enough for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us here today. Um, again, everyone should check out um, Boom Lawyer Podcast too for very helpful breakdowns of um, court cases and understanding um, legal arguments around uh, repro rights. Um, thank you so much, Jessica. And for folks, um, as we're going through our panel um, and right before I kick it off to Kieran to introduce our next panelist, if you have questions for folks, please enter them in the chat and we will get to them at the end. Um, thank you again, Jessica, so much for um, uh, sharing your expertise. And I will kick it over to Kieran to introduce our final panelist. Thank you so much. I'm so thrilled to introduce our next panelist, Pepis Rodriguez. Uh, he uses he, him pronouns uh, and is dedicated to combating state control and marginalization of individuals and communities based on their gender or sexuality. He is a litigation counsel at the Lawyering Project and has litigated reproductive rights cases throughout the country in both state and federal courts. He was previously a staff attorney at the Center for HIV Law and Policy, where he worked to end HIV criminalization and advance sexual and reproductive health services for youth in state custody. Pepis received his JD from the Georgetown University Law Center and his BA from the University of Florida. He is licensed to practice in New York. Pepis, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here, and especially with such great co-panelists. And, and I want to say before uh, we get into any of my questions, um, none of what I'm, I'm going to say here uh, should be considered legal advice. 
and and the views I express are, are my own and they're not those of, of the lawyering project or anyone associated with the lawyering project necessarily. Thank you for that. So first question for you, I wanted to see if you could talk us through the recent case in Alabama that labels embryos created through in vitro fertilization children and talk about the impacts that that case could have on those using reproductive technology. Sure, so there's definitely a lot to unpack here. And um, honestly, I think there could be like a, a whole session just on this, but um, to, to try to be brief about it and, and hit on some of the major points, this is a, a wrongful death suit. Um, and so just for a little bit of background, these are claims that are, are generally brought by close relatives of, of someone who has died. Um, and it's, it's just to compensate for suffering, for harm uh, after losing that loved one. And you know they're directed towards someone, some actor who may be considered uh, legally liable for that death. Um, so, so that's the context that we're talking about here with this, with this uh, case that, that went up to the Alabama Supreme Court. Um, and for a little bit of factual background, this has to do with uh, an IVF clinic uh, in which um, some, some frozen embryos were, were destroyed uh, as a result of, of, of an accident. And so, um, you know, the families of those involved brought this suit. And the district court in, in Alabama actually uh, ruled that embryos that exist in vitro are not people, they're not children, for the purposes of the, the wrongful death statute uh, that Alabama has. It's called the Wrongful Death of Minor Act. Um, so that's the law issue. Uh, the, the plaintiffs appealed and it went up to the Supreme Court of Alabama that, uh, you know, it ultimately ruled that under this statute, you know, this statute applies to, and, and I'm quoting here, it applies to, quote, all unborn children without limitation, and that includes unborn children who are not located in utero at the time they are killed, end quote. And so, of course, that has, that's, that's the, the, the main ruling that has had such a big impact. And, um, you know, what, the curious thing here is that for a state like Alabama, this is a little bit unremarkable when you look at some of the history. And I know we've already talked about this a little bit on this panel, um, but we've already seen Alabama use chemical endangerment laws in the criminal context. Of course, we heard about the Unborn Life Ballot Initiative. And, um, and really, the Supreme Court was sort of following precedent here. So in that sense, this is kind of unremarkable. But um, there are other pieces that really draw uh, a lot of attention. So, for example, we see a lot of religious language in not just the opinion of the court, but also in a concurring opinion that um, that agreed with the outcome, didn't like the reasoning, gave a slightly different reasoning, but still had a lot of that religious language. And so you see where, you know, as, as we heard earlier, there's a desire to try to hide behind religious beliefs. Um, even though, of course, there's a diversity of religious beliefs. Um, and so we see a sort of prioritization of one type of faith, one specific type of, of belief, um, and uh, sort of trying to monopolize that narrative. Um, we also see um, the other interesting piece from, from this opinion is we, we see a, a sort of explicit uh, reliance on the text of the statute as, as not barring um, embryos or, or fetuses even from, uh, from, from coming under the, the scope of the statute. But of course, we see that, you know, the, the statute at issue dates back to the 1800s before ART, before IVF. And, and so it, it, it doesn't really fit. And this is where we see the lack of nuance. And it's not just in the legal arguments at issue, but also in, in the practical ability of, of the courts to be able to adequately address sociopolitical needs in certain contexts. Um, and especially when you think about wrongful death, you know, sometimes we do want the ability to recover for suffering and for harm, right? W when there is a wanted pregnancy and as a result of either, you know, some, some negligence or some intentional act, we may want to have that ability within our legal system to recover, but when and how do we implement it, right? We need precision, we need carefully crafted language, 
and an acknowledgement of, of the various interests at issue beyond just pushing an ideological imperative for, for fetal personhood. Um, and so the way this could affect um, assisted reproductive technologies, it, it, there, there are a number of ways, right? So most obviously we, we get the question, what is the level of care due to embryos? Well, under this court, we, we get a very extreme uh, take on that. Um, I think another another issue here is is well, what about genetic testing for for pre-implantation embryos? I mean, that's a big part of of why IVF um, is is such a, a a a wanted and attractive course for for many people. Um, if if uh, if discarding uh, pre-implantation embryos is uh, is something that's going to make one legally liable, then what's the point of genetic testing, right? Um, at another extreme, uh, IVF could be banned altogether. Now we saw the chilling effect of uh, of this su Alabama Supreme Court opinion. It didn't go that far, but uh, as to ban it explicitly, but the chilling effect was the same, right? Um, and then of course we could see increasing regulation, as we saw with abortion back in the Roe days, through trap laws. Um, so so there's a lot of different ways I think this this could come out. Um, I'll, I'll stop there, but like I said, I mean, this real, there really is a lot that, that, could, uh, that could be discussed when it comes to this issue. Pepe's, thank you so much. That I, there's definitely a lot to cover, and I appreciate you taking the time to break it down for us. Um, I want to be mindful of time, so I'm going to move to our next question. Um, in the last few years, we've seen the anti-abortion movement use local strategies, such as the Sanctuary Cities for the Unborn movement, to advance deeply popular anti-abortion views. Do you see potential for the fetal personhood movement to use similar tactics? And are there any other strategies or types of legislation that you think we might see more of in this post-road landscape? Yeah, so, well, well, I think to answer your first question, they already are. Um, you know, the, the, the way I see it, sanctuary cities for the unborn, you know, that, that kind of strategy it is absolutely about fetal personhood. It may not be explicitly so in, in every circumstance, um, and it may in fact be primarily about just creating barriers to abortion generally, but um, but I think they're one and the same. And actually, you know, uh, Jessica mentioned the, the Alliance Defending Freedom. Uh, they're pushing this strategy in Texas and New Mexico and other places, um, but, but I do think it's absolutely about fetal personhood and having these arbitrary distinctions, um, you know, it, it can sometimes confuse the issue. Um, I, I think the, the, the way to look at it is, is that protecting the unborn is, um, you know, there's no reason to push that while curtailing the rights of living, breathing people um, just to further the rights of, of you know, so-called unborn people who cannot voice their needs, they cannot voice their wants, and, and to whom, by definition, it's impossible to be politically accountable to. Um, we, you know, we could see states act um, through legislation or, or constitutional amendments to, to try to push things like this. Um, at the local level, I'm not so sure that that necessarily we would see, say, explicitly fetal personhood ordinances. Um, but but something in particular is, um, you know, we kind of have to take note of, of where things are already happening. And, and I think one particular place to focus on is abortion bans. Um, in the states that have banned abortion after Dobbs, uh, how do how do the exceptions work, right? We 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 talked briefly about the Imtala case earlier, um, and and of course that was before the U.S. Supreme Court. But but that raises questions about fetal personhood as well. Not I mean we saw um, Justice Alito raise that issue, um, but but also how would exceptions work to to abortion bans when the embryo or fetus at issue is considered a person, right? If if you take that to its logical conclusion that is akin to murder. And of course, that is what anti-abortion activists want. But politically, I don't know how you make that work. Um, and I think the interesting thing, as we saw in Alabama, is, is that there's always going to be some tension when we have to actually see these laws, these, uh, you know, these legal precedents go into effect and practically affect people on the ground. That's when I think we're going to start to see that that this is untenable. Yes, absolutely. And I appreciate you spelling out that even 
things that don't necessarily describe themselves as fetal personhood laws can still have the effect that an outright fetal personhood law would. Um, so for our last question, I wanted to ask, what are some successful strategies for arguing against fetal personhood from a legal perspective? And are there any cases that serve as good examples of ways to shut down this fetal personhood narrative? Yeah, so I think uh, I'll, I'll take a broad view of that question. Um, and, and I think we can operationalize successful in, in, in different ways. I think, um, you know, the, the, the sort of normative moral argument has not really been successful in a traditional sense, right? This, um, this uh, really is the battle that we've been waging for, for some time now, but I, I don't think that means that we should give up on it, right? I think we should keep mo uh, moving forward with arguments, legal arguments uh, based in human rights. Um, you know, the idea of, of people being able to have bodily autonomy and moral agency, um, being able to decide if, when, and how to procreate. Um, and, and similarly, uh, al along this sort of normative moral view, a, a push back against uh, the, the, the attempts to, to have ideological or theological views rule, right? We, we cannot have that happen. Um, and, and so we do see some of that. As I said, this is sort of the battle we've been waging for some time. We see it in state litigation. So, so for example, in New Mexico, where various municipalities have been pushing uh, for, for these sanctuary cities for the unborn, um, we, we see some state litigation there where the, the, the state AG actually filed suit. Um, and so, you know, I, I think certainly those arguments we can keep making. But, but I think the other side, which is maybe the, the, more, uh, the more traditional accepted <laughs> view of, of what is successful, um, we, can, we can look to more consequentialist legal arguments that, that look at, uh, you know, what are the consequences of, of pushing these, these ideological narratives? And, and really that's, as I said, towards the end of the, the, my last answer, it, it's about forcing the other side to deal with the political realities of, of, of what happens practically when these things go into effect. Alabama offers a good example after this, uh, the the Supreme Court's opinion, they quickly, you know, the, the legislature there scrambled to try to to fix that. Now, whether that is going to be successful, whether that's going to be enough, like it, it remains to be seen. But notably, the clinics at the center of the case said that they think the law falls short of addressing, you know, fertilized eggs that are currently already stored at at facilities. Um, and so you see, like that, the, sort of the backtracking is a little bit too late there. Um, I think uh, uh, Dobbs is another good example, right? I think more broadly, um, what happens when abortion bans actually go into effect and we see the devastation that causes in so many different ways. Um, and, and, and ultimately to, to this consequentialist uh, take on it, I think something that, that can be important is to push uh, legislators, especially in, in states where, you know, there, there's a, a firm control over the legislature, and we know that that these uh, these bills are, are ultimately going to pass, push legislators to, to try to at least affect the legislative history, because then that's something that we can work with in, in you know, when it comes to litigating. Um, with a rich legislative history where there are questions about, well, how is this actually going to uh, affect people uh, practically. How is this actually going to affect the, me you know, the medical side of it, the the, the public health side of it? Um, I, I think that's what's ultimately, you know, kind of the way forward. But I do think it's important to acknowledge and, and really make peace with the fact that we're not going to shut down the fetal personhood narrative. It, it, it's about continuing to find ways to push the arguments that we want um, and and help the people that are most affected, of course. Absolutely, and I just really appreciate you tying in the way uh, Alabama legislature tried to backtrack because I think it shows anti-abortion activists are very quickly having to grapple with the fact that their views are extremely unpopular. Uh, Pepys, thank you again for joining us today, and I will pass it back to Jessica. Great, thank you so much.
Um, before we dive into our Q&A, we'll do some housekeeping so you can plug into ReproAction campaigns by signing up for alerts at reproaction.org. And you can follow us at, on social media, um, always at ReproAction. And then save the date for our next webinar, Attacks on Later Abortion, that will take place on Monday, June 17th at noon Eastern Standard Time. And now for the Q&A portion, again, as you have questions, um, please feel free to enter them as we have about 10 minutes left. Um, so my first question that I have for the panelists, anyone who wants to take it, please go ahead. Uh, we have a submission is, what actions should we be taking to combat fetal personhood legislation beyond legal action? Are there talking points or framing we should engage with if we are organizers within the abortion space? So any panelists who would want to jump in, please feel free. Well, I, I can I can add something quickly, though I, I suspect that um, others probably have have better things to contribute. <laughs> but but to to my last point that I ended on, um, when when these bills are are coming up, um, you know you can testify uh, before your state legislature, and I think um, you know putting forward the the realities of of how these various laws will affect people. Um, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, I, I think that is is incredibly helpful. But you know, as as you said in the question, like beyond beyond the legal aspects, like I think other things can be more helpful. So I'll, I'll let the other panels panelists chime in. This is Jess Piclo, and I, I'm I'm going to piggyback off that legal a little bit because I along the lines of the uh, sort of renewed focus nationally in the conversation around uh, fetal personhood is a counter argument around a renewed and invigorated conversation around the Equal Rights Amendment. And while they're not necessarily uh, co-equal and, and parallel um, beings, I think that it is important to engage the uh, ERA uh, arguments and advocacy around there because to underscore many of the points made in this webinar, it helps get to the practical implications of fetal personhood in addition to the legal implications of it. Hi, Kulsumi Jazz here. Um, thanks so much for peace and uh, for for uh, adding to the conversation and Jessica. Um, the, the other thing that I'd like to highlight again is, you know, there is this cultural push across the nation to put the blame and responsibility of societal problems on vulnerable and marginalized communities instead of where the blame actually lies, which is a fundamental failure of our government to protect the rights of marginalized communities. And so one clear way to push back against this nefarious concept of fetal personhood that strips the rights of pregnant and birthing people across the nation is by putting that onus back on our governments and to push back against these laws um, and, 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 and the, the rhetoric that they're being supported under. Um, one clear way to do that is to promote the understanding that law enforcement, healthcare providers should not be working together to punish pregnant and birthing people. Um, the healthcare providers should be following scientific and medical evidence and not be sidetracked by the stigma associated with uh, substance use, for example, that's used to criminalize folks. Um, and I think more broadly, in terms of you know, really pushing against um, this concept gaining traction, uh, we not only want to combat um, the use of um, expanding this this framework in legislation, as as Pisa so incisively mentioned, but we also want to monitor and keep track of 
our judicial system and you know really getting out there and physic uh, and and civically engaging to make sure that we are electing folks that are not going to put judges on benches that are going to unravel the rights that we have worked so hard to establish in this country uh, for marginalized communities. So that's that's really the last thing that I'll say. Great, thank you all so much. Um, uh, one thing um, that I was curious about is, um, is there any uh, form of responsibility that we should be putting on um, tech companies? I know that's like a, a very broad subject and we've done webinars on it specifically, but is there anything off the top of um, any of our panelists' heads of, of like work that can be done on that front to help prevent um, criminalization of pregnant people? I, I will add um, my opinion here. <laughs> I, think, I think there's certainly a lot that can be done uh, on, on the privacy front, right? Um, but I think ultimately um, I'm skeptical of, of uh, tech companies or really any corporation um, ultimately being um, uh, sort of the, the bottom line because ultimately they're not accountable, right? They're accountable to shareholders. Um, they're, they're not accountable to, to people who, who, I mean, the people, they, they are elected, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, they're not, they're not elected, therefore they're not politically accountable. And so um, I, I, I just don't, I, I have trouble seeing that as, as sort of the stopgap as opposed to some kind of state mechanism. But I, I, I certainly think that um, they, they can be doing more. And I think some companies are, are doing better than others, but um, I, you know, that's, that's a sphere, a legal sphere that I, I know frighteningly little about, unfortunately. Yeah, thank you for sharing. It is definitely um, a, a complicated space uh, for that reason, but um, definitely on all fronts, trying to combat the fetal personhood narrative um, is definitely helpful. Um, and um, we only have a few minutes left, so I just want to ask our lovely co-host, Kieran, if you have anything else that you'd like to add from any of the questions that we've asked, um, or just ask a, if you have any quick questions for our panelists before we close out. Thank you. So I had had a thought on uh, the question you asked about tech companies and fetal personhood. And I want to tie that into something that a few of our panelists have talked about. Um, regard, and I'm specifically thinking of how Kulsum talked about um, how healthcare providers and the police should not be working in tandem. Like social media companies and the police should not be working in tandem. There should not be instances where social media companies are just handing over people's messages. If I'm remembering correctly, there was a case where a social media company handed over uh, the messages of a person who had been seeking an abortion. And that is extremely concerning because why is, why is someone like Facebook uh, becoming involved in police matters and legal matters? Why are they functioning as an arm of the police. So that's that's just something I was thinking about regarding that question. Yeah, thank you for tying that in. Um, and I I think um, I have one, one final thought before we'll close out, sort of circling back to that, one of the previous questions um, regarding combating the fetal personhood conversation beyond legislation. Um, and that is, and again, it's just reiterating what Kulsum has said, what Jessica has said, what Papisa has said uh, at varying points throughout this panel. And it's that um, abortion bans, um, in, including fetal personhood equate to criminalization of pregnant people, regardless of whatever loving language big pro-life wants to wrap that up in. And I think that's always important to punt it back to the people proposing um, fetal personhood legislation or proposing um, fetal personhood language of yeah, what are the realistic outcomes of this? And the realistic outcomes is putting 
uh, pregnant people in jail. Um, and that's unconscionable and um, has been happening and we must fight back against this. So um, thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you for um, uh, Kieran for putting this uh, webinar together. Thank you so much to our panelists, Colson, Jessica and Papis for lending your time and your expertise for folks. Um, and you all have a uh, wonderful rest of your day. Take care, everybody.